Thank you for joining us today for this important conversation around COVID-19 and the influence it has had on neuromuscular research, as well as exploring the COVID-19 vaccine development. I'm Dr. Sharon Hesterly, MV MDA's Executive Vice President and Chief Research Officer. I'm honored to be joined today by Dr. Jeffrey Statlin and Dr. David Swerdlow. Dr. Statlin is the Associate Professor of Neurology at KU Medical Center in Kansas City. Dr. David Swerdlow is the Global COVID Vaccine Medical Lead for Pfizer. Dr. Statlin and Dr. Swerdlow, we are both honored to have you here today. Thanks for inviting I'm happy to be here. We're thrilled to have these doctors with us today as medical experts. Please understand they are not providing medical advice during today's program. Any decisions about your care should be made in conjunction with your doctor. We look forward to spending the next half hour an answering your questions. Before we start, I would like to thank our Facebook Live supporters, Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America Inc. and Sanofi Genzyme for their generous support of today's program. In a recent poll of MDA's Research Advisory Board, 100% of the respondents indicated that COVID-19 has affected their research, with 54% stating that the pandemic has had a significant impact. The COVID-related challenges reported for research range from the inability to access their laboratories to the loss of key staff to furloughs or layoffs. And uh, perhaps of most concern to our topic today, 31% of investigators reported disruptions to ongoing clinical trials for neuromuscular disease. Dr. Statlin, let's start the conversation with COVID's influence on clinical trials. So first of all, are neuromuscular disease trials still taking place during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, so I mean, neuromuscular clinical trials are still taking place, but as you can imagine, um, COVID has affected our ability to do the neuromuscular clinical trials in many of the same ways that it's impacted our lives in the way that we interact with our family or friends, um, the way that it may have changed our jobs, having to work from home and the way we traveled. And when we think about our neuromuscular studies, we have to remember that we have to abide by the rules from state to state. Institution. That said, I wanna say we are really committed to what I call the neuromuscular research enterprise. I think for many of our inherited diseases of nerve and muscle, we're at this sort of transitional point where we're really talking about the, the actual possibility of potentially transformational therapies in the next few years. And so we're very committed to trying to get these studies to move forward. But to answer your question in a far more practical way, at the University of Kansas Medical Centers, we had 60 active neuromuscular clinical trials going on at the start of the pandemic. We've had three studies that either stopped or had to hold the startup of the studies due to the, the pandemic, but that means the vast majority of our studies are still operating. However, they've all been impacted in one way or another in the way that we're conducting those studies. So it's great to hear that they're continuing on. Have you had to make adjustments to how you do the studies um, to accommodate you know, various uh, research projects during COVID? Yeah, we, we've had to make a number of adaptations. And I think maybe let me just take a moment to discuss the, the types of studies, give some examples of the categories where we've made the adaptations. And then what I wanna do is, is give two examples of clinical trials happening at our institution to show how we've adapted. When we think of clinical trials, we really think of two types. Interventional studies, these are the classic studies where we're giving someone a, dr a drug and we're seeing whether it's helping them or not, or maybe we're doing an exercise intervention. Observational studies, on the other hand, are studies we use to really determine um, what we know about a different disease or to build the infrastructure or tools that we would use in the setting of an interventional study. And the two really interact with each other, are equally important, but may have separate uh, guidelines at different institutions and how they're running. We also have to remember that for each of these studies, there's many different players on the field. We have our sponsors, which could be companies or academic uh, individuals or institutions. We have the institution at which the study is running, and then we have the states that they're running in. And so we have to think of the policies in all those different areas. For every individual study, we separately weigh the risk 
versus the benefit of continuing that study. And the goals here, if we make an adaptation, is we really need to be able to maintain the data integrity. We have to ask ourselves what's absolutely necessary in this study to get an answer to the study question. Some of the categories we might be thinking about would be the drug. For example, if you were on an immunosuppressant drug in the setting of a viral epidemic, we might be concerned whether that drug would put you at greater risk. Some of the outcome measures we collect may have to have special requirements. For example, outcome measures for breathing where you're coughing or taking deep breaths, we may have to take special precautions to get those. There may be changes in the study visits. Certain study visits that we would have done in person, we may have you do them from home. And we'll ask ourselves which ones are absolutely necessary. And we may be thinking about ways to use new technologies like telehealth or the ability to visit over two-way video on the internet to collect some of the information we need, the interviews, some of the assessments. We can even bring in companies like home health companies to come to someone's house to collect lab values or vitals. That's, there are going to be some things we just can't do at home. For example, a biopsy or collecting an MRI. Let me use just two examples to illustrate this. One of them is an interventional study, the other one's an observational study that are going on at our site. The first one is a, a drug study in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis being run by one of my colleagues, uh, Richard Barron. It's to study 90 people at about 10 sites across the United States to see if this drug memantine slows down the loss of function in ALS. Early on in the study, they realized that this pandemic was going to dramatically impact what they were doing. So they had their external advisory committee joined together with all their site PIs, and they said, what can we do to change this study so we can continue to meet its goals? And they decided to collect their primary outcome using remote visits. And they could do this because the measurement, the ALS functional rating scale, had already been validated to collect it remotely. To get important biomarkers for the study, they designed lab kits that they can send to the house and people collect there. To overcome some of the measurements we have to do as people enter a clinical trial to see if they qualify, they allowed researchers to look back at clinic visits that may have occurred within several months of enrolling in the study and take procedures from those clinic visits. But in order to do this, they had to formally change their protocol. They had to talk to their statistician to make sure they could still reach their study goals. And then they had to talk to the FDA as well to make sure that this would be acceptable. Luckily, because they put all this in place quickly, they have been able to meet their goals and meet recruitment. Another study is the opposite kind, an observational study being run by me and a colleague of mine, Robbie Tawil, we're running a study in fasciosscapulohumeral muscular dystrophy really to prepare for clinical trials. So we're running the study to build the tools that we would use in the setting of a clinical trial. We have 220 individuals participating at 11 sites in the US, but also in Europe. Immediately we realized because some of the European countries were closing early that we were gonna have to make adaptations to our study. So what we did is we got all of our site PIs on a phone call. We discussed it with the National Institutes of Health who was sponsoring us and our study statistician. We made the decision to collect questionnaires that people could do from home to do them just like we would normally do in the study. We decided to expand our visit windows because we thought the most important thing was keeping people in our study. So for example, a 12 month visit could incur anywhere from nine months to 15 months. We also decided to implement a pilot project to get remote assessments. And in this project, we were really interested, could we collect some of the functional motor assessments that we do in person? For example, how quickly someone can walk or get up from a chair and turn. Can we do this from the home via two-way video with an experienced evaluator? We also added other things like motion monitors, small devices about the size of a rich swatch that can monitor the activity you're doing in the home. And our thought was to do this to prepare for a future where we may be able to collect this information from home 
or have clinical trials where we may need to suddenly, due to unforeseen circumstances, substitute a home visit for one that would be done in person. And our study as well, it's continuing on. So has the FDA provided any guidance um, on how to keep trials going through COVID-19? Yeah, I think that both the FDA and the National Institutes of Health were very proactive in providing guidance. The FDA actually has put out a official guidance for industry, our institutions, and our regulatory boards as early as March 2020. It was really in a discussion format discussing many of the concepts that you and I have already talked about. Um, it's really centering on safety first for the study and the ability of the study to achieve its, its primary goals. Um, they talk very much about doing a risk and benefit assessment for each study, thinking about alternative methods for uh, study visits or for collecting information. One of the key things they discuss is the need to ensure data quality may require a shifting from in-person monitoring visits to using techniques like central or remote monitoring. And in all of them, they talk about the need to discuss with the FDA and the regulatory board um, for all of the changes that you're making. Thanks. So people out there listening might be wondering, is it safe to participate in clinical trials? It's great to hear that they're still happening. But what questions should someone ask or think about if they're approached about participating? Yeah, first, I, I don't think we would be running the clinical trials if we didn't think we could be bringing people in safely. There's many people, not just me, that uh, look over each study to make sure that we think this is true. Um, I can just give you an example of what we do at KU um, to, so you can see some of the things that may be in place at different sites. For example, if someone's coming to our site for research, our clinical center is at a completely different place from our hospital with its own entrance. Every time someone comes in that building, we're checking their temperature. We're also asking them a series of questions as whether they've been exposed to anyone who's been sick. We only allow one person to accompany you. And the reason why is because we want to be able to maintain that key social distance for the whole time your, your uh, study visit. We really look at each visit to try to minimize its length to lessen the exposure to other people as well as to our staff. Everyone you interact with will be wearing a mask and gloves and then depending on the procedures, they may be in full protective equipment. But it's very important for you to ask each investigator or the research staff at the site that you'll be going to because these policies can be different from one place to another in the country. So all things considered then, how do you feel about the impact of COVID-19 research on neuromuscular disease? We heard there's short-term impact for sure, but what do you think it'll be in the long run? I think it's really an unknown right now. I mean, what we don't know is the effect of COVID-19 and the social policies that have been in place for COVID-19 on the outcome measures that we're collecting in these clinical trials. But the truth is, it's the world we're living in, and so we really need to be able to adapt. And I'm optimistic about the future that we'll be able to do this and still get meaningful data. So I guess finally, are there any silver linings here? Some of these uh, interesting and creative ways to collect data remotely, uh, do you think that they will persist and be used in future trials, even without the background of a pandemic going on? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's a truism, right? They say adversity breeds innovation, and I think that's really been true here as well. I'm quite uh, optimistic about this move towards uh, remote assessments and this idea of decentralized clinical trials. We've really been discussing it for almost a decade. It would be a major benefit in rare diseases where often a limitation to participating is the ability to get to a center, you know, multiple times to participate in a clinical trial. And so if we could decentralize this, allow people to join from home, I think more pe people could potentially be able to participate in the studies in the trial process. That said, I do think there's work that we're going to need to do to validate these tools and to really understand um, how things change in people when we're measuring it from their homes, but I'm quite optimistic. So thank you, Dr. Stadlin, for sharing that important information and for the work that you're doing on innovating around clinical trials during this time. Um, if you're interested in finding out more on neuromuscular clinical trials, here are a few places to look. 
clinicaltrials.gov. Also, MDA has a neuromuscular disease clinical trial tool uh, finder available at the link that you see on your screen. So this is a great tool where you will be asked some questions and then directed to appropriate trial options to explore. MDA will also be rolling out a clinical trials education series in the near future, so please be on the lookout for that resource as well. So let's transition now over to the COVID-19 vaccine development process. We've heard about how we're currently coping in this environment, but now we're very um, thrilled to have Dr. Swordlow here to talk to us about vaccine development, particularly because our neuromuscular community is um, could be at high risk, risk giving pulmonary and cardiac complications that can be common. So Dr. Swerdlow, can you tell us about yourself and your role in the vaccine process for Pfizer? Hi, thanks so much for inviting me to speak with you. It's exciting to be able to share some of our enthusiasm for working on a vaccine that may save lives and help to stop this terrible pandemic. I'm an infectious disease trained physician and epidemiologist. I worked at CDC in Atlanta for 25 years before joining Pfizer five years ago. At CDC, I was involved in numerous epidemic or pandemic responses, including leading the response to the previous coronavirus epidemic caused by the MERS coronavirus. I also held leadership roles during the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic, the response to the cholera outbreak in Haiti after the earthquake, Hurricane Katrina, the anthrax attacks in 2001 and others. At Pfizer, I lead the COVID vaccine global medical team. Our team is the face of Pfizer to ministries of health, recommending bodies, healthcare workers, and the public. Thank you. So given your experience, ex extensive experience on other pandemics and epidemics, can you tell us why the COVID pandemic has been so difficult to control? Thanks. In, in recent years, we've faced several pandemic threats or pandemics. The Influenza H1N1 pandemic in 2009 was caused by a very transmissible virus, but it wasn't very severe. The SARS outbreak of 2002, 2003, and the MERS coronavirus outbreak, which started in 2012, were both severe, but in the end were not very transmissible. Both, both have been contained. Uh, one of the reasons they could be contained was because most infected persons had severe disease, and thus they could be identified and placed in isolation where they wouldn't make people, others sick. Further, the SARS and the MERS virus tended to be located deep in the lungs of patients, so it wasn't easy to spread. The, the current pandemic virus, SARS-CoV-2, is different because it is both severe and transmissible. It is harder to control for many reasons, but one is because many infected people don't have any symptoms at all. They're asymptomatic. Um, so they can transmit to others without even knowing it. Further, the virus tends to be located in large quantities in the upper respiratory tract or the nose instead of the deep lungs. So it's easier to spread to others. These factors and others make controlling the virus difficult. So can you give us some idea how Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine works and also what is the status of the vaccine? So as you know, there are almost 200 um, vaccine candidates being developed by companies all over the world using inactivated or weakened viruses, viral vectors, or protein-based vaccines. Most of these require the researchers to possess and be able to grow the actual organism. Nucleic acid vaccines, of which mRNA vaccines are one type, don't require the actual virus. All you need is the genetic code. After researchers in China published the code for the new coronavirus in early January of this year, our collaborators at BioNTech, a German company, were able to start work on the virus without having to obtain and grow the virus. So it's safer, quicker, and faster to make a mRNA virus vaccine than other types of vaccines. So how do mRNA vaccines work? Well, the mRNA vaccine is injected into the upper arm, hidden in a, a small lipid or fatty particle. And then the vaccine's mRNA message is taken up by human cells. These human cells then think the message is like any other mRNA molecule that it uses to produce everyday proteins. And therefore it's tricked to produce many copies of the spike protein, the protein that makes up the corona or crown that you've all seen in images of the SARS virus. 
your body then realizes that the spike protein is foreign and shouldn't be there and creates antibodies to it, which will lead to immunity. Several candidate or versions of the vaccines were tested in animals and found to be safe and produce a strong immune response. Four of these vaccine candidates were then tested in human volunteers. One of these candidates, which we call BNT162B2, or B2 for short, demonstrated a good safety profile and indu induced a strong immune response and was selected to be used during the next stages of development. So what is the current status of our vaccine? Well, we're currently conducting what we call a phase 2B3 large clinical trial to test the safety and efficacy of our vaccine in persons over the age of 16. It will include up to 44,000 participants um, from the US and several other countries. The study is a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blinded study. So what does all that mean? Well, half of the participants will receive the B2 vaccine and half will receive a placebo. Neither the investigators nor the participants will know whether they received the vaccine or the placebo. Then we will monitor participants to see if they develop symptoms of COVID. If they do, they will be tested to see if they are infected with SARS-CoV-2. Using simple math, you can then determine how effective the vaccine is. Meanwhile, we will be carefully monitoring all the participants to see if any safety issues arise. Of course, we don't anticipate that that will happen, but we will be, a, we'll, we will be observing and evaluating carefully. So Dr. Swordler, I think we're all used to the idea that vaccine development usually takes years, um, but it, the whole process seems to have been greatly um, sped up in light of this sort of global emergency. Can you describe how Pfizer has been able to speed up the development steps for the COVID-19 vaccine versus traditional methods? Sure. Um, companies, including ours, have compressed vaccine development from years to months without missing any safety steps. We have leveraged decades of experience developing, testing, and manufacturing vaccines. Most notably, we've been doing things simultaneously instead of one step at a time. For example, in our phase one trial, we tested four different vaccine candidates or versions instead of doing four sequential studies. Companies are starting to ramp up vaccine manufacturing facilities even before they know their vaccine will be approved. They are therefore manufacturing the vaccine at risk. Companies are willing to take the chance that, a, that if the vaccine is successful, they will be able to start delivering the vaccine almost immediately. If the vaccine is not successful, they will have lost a good deal of money, but given the circumstances, it is worth the risk. Planning for allocation and distribution is also being done at the same time as vaccine development. So the vaccines can be distributed as soon as the vaccines are approved. Do you think that one vaccine will work for the entire population? So far, we think the same vaccine will be given to everyone for whom it is indicated, um, but we have not yet tested the vaccine in children. And do you think that more than one uh, shot will be required? Will people need a booster vaccine? Yes, definitely. The, uh, the vaccine is actually a two-dose vaccine. So um, you, you, get, you get the first dose, and then 21 days later, you get the second dose. We, we don't yet know if yearly boosters will be required. So one other thought, too, you know, our, the population that MDA serves um, in our community, a lot of people are immunosuppressed, either taking steroids or other types of medications. Are there plans to evaluate the vaccine uh, efficacy and safety in immunosuppressed patients? Well, we will work with FDA to determine if any additional testing will be required in order for immunosuppressed persons to be able to receive the vaccine. Okay, and just so the community is aware, what is the difference between the flu vaccine and the vaccine that's being developed for COVID-19? And should people get the flu vaccine? There are many types of flu vaccines um, made by different companies and with different methods, but all made to protect people from getting the flu. Each year, strains are selected by the World Health Organization to be included in that year's vaccine to ensure that the vaccine will match the circulating strains. And yes, it is very important for everyone to get the flu vaccine this year. While we don't have a crystal ball on how bad the flu season could be, given circulation of SARS-CoV-2, we certainly want to prevent as many cases of the flu as possible. 
There are also pneumococcal vaccines available, and these should be given when indicated to prevent pneumococcal pneumonia as well. So finally, if someone out there listening is interested in participating in the Pfizer COVID-19 clinical trial, where can they go to find out more information? Yeah, there's a website that's um, www.covidvaccinestudy.com, um, all one word, COVID vaccines, no, COVID vaccine study.com. So they can go there and learn more about our vaccine and participating. All right. Thank you, Dr. Swordlow. That's all the questions we have time for today. Um, due to the pandemic, we at MDA are having to think of new and different ways to fund our mission, as well as new ways for us to connect with the community. I would like to thank again Mitsubishi, Tanabe Pharma, America, Inc., and Sanofi Genzyme for their support for this Facebook Live program. Thank you for attending today's Facebook Live event. If you are unable to join the full conversation, the recording will be available for playback on Facebook as well as at mda.org forward slash COVID-19. Dr. Statlin and Dr. Swerlow, I would like to again, thank you for joining us today and sharing all of this valuable information. It's my pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. So please stay tuned for additional community updates through MDA's COVID-19 response page, as well as on MDA's Facebook page. Please never hesitate to reach out to us at MDA. We are here to help. Thank you again for joining us today. All of us here at MDA wish you well and good health.